Good Sunday evening. Welcome to service tonight, and uh, thank you for hanging in there this morning. I know even with the sermon, uh, splitting it up, that wasn't my original plan, but uh, I know there's a lot of good truth here in 2 Peter chapter 2 that we want to see from God's Word. So again, thank you for joining us here this Sunday night. Looking forward to next week. Don't forget about that. Uh, where we're going to meet in person. I'm excited to do that. And just pray that we get that work done and ready to go, if you would, please. All right? Okay, let's hop into it tonight. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're in, um, we're going through verses 10 through 22 to finish out. And we dealt with, just this morning, uh, verses 10 through 14. And so we're going to pick up in verses 15 through 22. And I'm going to read them along. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to read them as we go along. But I did want to just give you uh, for a sense of review that we remember here that we're identifying false teachers. Or you remember we said they are who we thought they were. And um, they are marked by pride. We saw that in verses 10 through 13 that these false teachers, they lift themselves up. They make themselves the authority. Uh, not only that, but they, um, they have these animalistic tendencies. They just do things because they don't care what anyone else thinks. They're just animals and... Um, and they also speak evil of, of the authority. And so with that, it just leads to this uh, continual degradation of their life that they're marked also by immoral living. We saw in verse uh, 14 there that their eyes were full of adultery and they uh, practiced covetousness and, and they're cursed children. And that's something that I didn't deal with you on, but it's to understand that, um, that those cursed children, if I could just hit on that part real quick of, chap of verse 14, is that cursed children is that anybody that's not saved is is under the curse of sin okay do you understand and so outside of Jesus Christ coming in and supernaturally transforming our lives by us trusting the gospel of Jesus Christ repenting of our sins trusting the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, we're, we're still under that curse and so um, it's a reminder though that these false teachers, it's telling us, not a reminder, but it's teaching us as these false teachers, they know uh, the truth, but they are cursed, meaning this, that outside of, man, something transformational happening, they are bound to be cast into everlasting fire in, in the lake of fire. And because they are cursed children, that's who they are. That's what they're known by. You say, well, why would he put that at the end? You know what you notice if you read this? Peter's constantly reminding us through this chapter that their end is swift, their end is sudden, and, and their end is permanent. And it's death and hell for all eternity. And he just wants to remind us that that's not something. They may have all these nice things. They may have all this, live this open sin now. And these followers may follow after that and live in that open sin now. But the reality is this, that when it comes down to it, that their end is death and hell for all eternity. And so it's just a reminder that we need to be mindful of that. All right. So we're marking these ident we're identifying these um, uh, these false teachers by their pride, by their immoral living. And then I want you to see something kind of unique here. In verses 15 through 19, we're going to see here, or excuse me, 15 through 16, we're going to see here. Um, I guess through 19 is that we're going to see here that truth exposes them. The truth exposes them. So. They're exposed by their pride. They're exposed by their immoral living. We, we can identify them. And so you say, well, how do I know that that person that's preaching, teaching is a false teacher? Well, we know by the kind of uh, pride that lifts them up, the kind of living that they have. And you say, well, what if they, you know, they seem humble. They don't seem to be living in a moral life. But, you know, at the end of it, truth always exposes and so the truth exposes them. And so Peter gives them, gives us here a, an example. All right, he gives them an, an example of a prophet, a false prophet, that knew the truth and yet rejected it, and the truth ended up exposing him. And so these false teachers are marked by the same way. So let's take a look at what Peter's getting at here. Let's read verses 15 through 19 which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. 
These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. And so we see that truth exposes these false teachers. Truth exposes them. Well, in which way? The way of Balaam is how it exposes them. The Bible tells us the story that the way of Balaam, uh, we talk about that, is he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now we think about, uh, automatically when I'm studying this, that Romans 6.23 comes to mind. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've used that many times to witness to somebody or to speak to them about uh, the wages of sin and the payment for sin, if you will, or that which you receive for your sin is the deserve, the, uh, what we deserve for that payment is death and hell for all eternity. Well, the thing is that these false teachers are marked by the way of Balaam, meaning they love the wages of unrighteousness. But I want you to see, first of all, that the way of Balaam started out in a, well, kind of a unique way. Look what the Bible tells us in verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor. So let's stop right there for a second. So there was a right way, and then there's the way of Balaam. And they went ahead and forsook the right way and followed after the way of Balaam. And the example of Balaam here is that in Numbers 22, we're going to turn there in a moment, but not yet. In Numbers 22 through chapters 24, the Bible gives us the account. Uh, Moses writes down the account of this prophet named Balaam who knew the truth, and God had revealed himself to Balaam, and, but Balaam had a desire for, well, materialistic things. He was that false prophet that Peter was preaching about. In fact, he kind of culminates it here to show us that this is who I'm talking about. They're talking about Balaam here, and this, this false prophet, who was more interested in gaining uh, wages of unrighteousness. He, in other words, he was willing to do wicked things so that he can reap the financial benefits of, or, or be in the good side of, of a wicked king uh, as long as he did wicked things. So he was willing to forsake God's way and do it a wicked way and receive the temporal benefits of the wicked. Okay? And so Balaam is mentioned here in Balaam, excuse me, in Balaam, in Numbers 22. His whole idea was that he was hired by Balak, King Balak, to go out and to curse Israel. And so he would get up and, and he'd say, God, uh, or he'd tell uh, Balak, well, let me go and let me commune with the Lord. And the Lord said, you can go up, but I'm not going to be in your words. And so Balaam would get up there and, he, and Balak said, go curse, you're a prophet of God, go curse Israel. And so Balaam would get up there and he'd get ready to curse Israel. And what came out of his mouth was actually blessing. And Balak's sitting there going, what's he doing? Why is he blessing Israel? I want him to curse Israel. And yet he's blessing them. Well, he gets told. Balak looks at him and goes, what are you doing? I paid you this much money, if you will. To, I'm paraphrasing here, all right? Just giving you the Cliff's notes of this thing. Uh, him saying, I, I've given you this amount. Why aren't you cursing them? Balaam's like, well, I, you know, I, I'm trying to do the best I can. He, you know, he says, well, do it again. This time, curse them. You know, the Bible tells us though that God was revealing Himself the right way to Balaam, and each time Balaam would get out to give a curse to Israel, a blessing would come out. God wouldn't allow the curse to come out, but He'd allow a blessing to come out. And even in that, God was revealing Himself to Balaam right there, and He was showing him the right way. But Balaam, because of his love for unrighteousness, continued to follow that way. And then it tells us here the story of how he was rebuked for his iniquity. Okay, his sin is open sin. The Bible tells us in verse 16, The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. You say, well, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Numbers 22 if you would. 
It's all the way in the Old Testament. All right. Uh, Numbers 22 in the Old Testament. It's one of the first books of the Bible. All right. As we get to Numbers 22, we're going to read the account starting in actually um, verse 20. So Numbers 22 and verse 20, the Bible says, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. So he was going with the princes of Moab, who at the time were enemies to Israel. And God's anger was kindled because Balaam went with the princes of Moab. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. The angel of the Lord is standing here, stopping, stopping Balaam from going any further. And he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. So you imagine this, if you will, all right? So we have, we have this, this angel of the Lord standing standing there in the way of Balaam, and he's got a sword drawn, if you will. Now, I don't know. I mean, sometimes we sit there and, you know, uh, we're not talking about he's going fencing here, okay? We're talking about sword drawn, like he's ready to strike, okay? He's in a striking position. His sword is drawn. He's ready to strike. The Bible tells us in verse 23 of chapter 22 of Numbers that the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his side, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So here's the main road, and here's the angel of the Lord with a sword drawn, and the ass sees it, and it's like, whoa, Balaam, we're, we're getting out of here. So he goes off the road and into a field. And the Bible tells us that Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. So you imagine him, you know, kind of hitting this, this, essentially is what it is. It's a mixture of a, of a mule and a donkey, which makes a, a jackass. That's what it is. And so this, this ass is going off into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her to the way. Get back over here. Get on the road. What are you doing? You can imagine if you've spoken to your animal. Get out. Sit. You know? He's talking to his donkey here. He's talking to his, uh, his donkey and smote it and trying to get it back into the way. But the, the ass knew better to get out of the way because the angel of the Lord was there. The Bible tells us in verse 24, I hope you're seeing this unfold here. The angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. Okay, so now he's in the path of the vineyard. So there's a wall here and a wall here. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. So he's riding it. And here's a wall here, and here's a wall here. And the ass sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And what she does is she thrusts herself into the wall to kind of wake up Balaam, and it crushes his foot up against the wall. Okay? Are you seeing this as it's, it's, it's transpiring in Scripture? And um, uh, let's see here. And it crushed his foot, verse 25, against the wall. And Balaam, look what he does. He smote her again. He's, he's still not getting... He's, he's thinking, what is going on with this ass? What is taking place here? Verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place. So we went from the way. Now the way was a, was a wide way. And there's much preaching to be said about the fact that then came two walls. Many times when God is trying to get our attention, God was revealing himself to Balaam. He was standing in the way, trying to get him to focus in on what he was doing. So... He went into the field, so Balaam smote the ass. He gets him down into the vineyard with a wall on one side and a wall on the other. The, the, the ass, she thrusts herself into the wall and crushes the foot of Balaam. Now he goes, the angel of the Lord, Balaam smokes the ass again, and now he continues on his journey, not picking up that something must be wrong. He's not spiritually discerning because he's more concerned about the wages of unrighteousness than he is about the way of God. And that's what these false teachers are about. That's what it's exposing to us and Peter's trying to tell us. Get excited here because there's more to this story. The Bible tells us then that the angel of the Lord went further and in his grace stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right 
or to the left. So the donkey is stuck there, the ass is stuck there, with Balaam on its back, the angel of the Lord, it's at a narrow place. God is getting the attention of Balaam, but he's not seeing it. And he smote, uh, he smote the ass for this. And the angel of the Lord stood there. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she just fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled. And he smote the ass with a staff. So now, it's one thing. He went to a field. Okay. His foot gets crushed. Now, the, uh, the donkey just, the ass just drops right in front of the angel of the Lord. And because it's a narrow place. And instead of seeing, man, something must be wrong. You know, many times, God's giving us, trying to wake us up to tell us that there's something in the way. But, and he's given us these opportunities to turn from it. And yet, we're not taking the opportunities to turn from it. Now, that's why I said there's a whole lot of preaching there. That's not even our message here tonight. But we can get into that. The fact of the matter is, though, that, that as, as this ash is laying down, now Balaam, instead of saying something's wrong, he takes his staff and he starts whooping. This, he starts whooping this, this ass and he's smiting it and he's hitting it and he smote the ass with his staff and then this is what happens. So you need. This is, explains that verse in uh, verse 16. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword of mine, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Kind of funny. Always love that part, because he said nay, like a horse saying nay, right? All right, that's where my mind goes. All right. Verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and a sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Now the story goes on, and we're not here to finish that story here tonight. Maybe for your own edification, finish Numbers 22 through 24 and see the story, the sad story of Balaam there. But the Bible tells us, Peter gives us the relation here, a biblical example of how truth exposes. The truth exposed Balaam's life that the Bible tells us that truth was uh, exposed in Balaam's life. There was the right way, and he still went the wrong way. There was the way then there was the way of the vineyard, and then there was the narrow way, and he still didn't get it, and he'd rather choose to go on and do the wages of unrighteousness and fulfill that. And God had to use, the Bible tells us, the dumb ass. When it says that dumb ass, it's talking about that uh, an, an ass that can't talk, a, a donkey that can't talk. It, it's supposed to be silent. But God gave it a man's voice, to speak to Balaam, to wake him up, to go, hey, what you're doing, don't you know? Why are you doing this to me? The, the ass speaks to him, why are you doing this to me? Why would I do this to you these three times? Have I not been a good ass to you? He's speaking to Balaam, and Balaam's, you know, sitting there speaking back to it. I don't know about you, okay? Two places in Scripture that really weird me out. Eve speaking to a serpent, and Balaam communicating to his ass. I'm just saying, if your dog, right, let's 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 pick on Damien and Mirtha here for a second, okay? Because because they have uh, they have Romeo out there, and I know they got Rocky and um, and Juliet, and um, I know there's another one. I'm missing the other one, but anyway, uh, but Romeo, Rocky, and Juliet. Maybe it's just three. Anyway, but uh, you know, if if you know, the other day we we're at the house and we were fellowshipping, and and Romeo sitting there and starts talking. And, you know, that would probably weird me out. But what if Brother Damien looked back at Romeo and said, well, I don't know why you're, you're so upset, Romeo. That kind of floored me more than the dog talking to me. It's the fact that it didn't floor Damien. He's just talking right back to the dog. The thing is that he was being rebuked. Truth was exposing, exposing Balaam. 
And yet, the truth rebukes, and they still choose the wages of unrighteousness. That's what these false teachers are known by. Well, what's it mean, Pastor? It means that they know many times the way of God, and they know the truth, but they'd rather have the covetousness of their own heart and reap the wages of unrighteousness. You know what we could say? They would rather reap the wages of the temporal things of this life and take people down with them than be more consumed in living for eternity. So the way of Balaam, maybe we can put it this way, their love for money exposes them. It goes on in truth that exposes them is that their life is then revealed. The kind of person they are is revealed. So truth exposes their life. Just as much as the truth exposed Balaam's false being a false prophet. By the way, the Bible tells us that the, the, the ass speaking in verse 16 with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Think about that for a moment. Peter compared to the fact that Balaam, at this point, he was so driven by his love for the wages of unrighteousness, his love for money being the root of all evil, mind you. He was so driven by that, that the description here is the madness of the prophet. It had driven him to a point that he, he was like a madman that just wanted more and more and more. And that's what these false teachers are marked by. So then their life is revealed. Look what it says here. These are wells without water, verse 17, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. You know, basically what these types of false prophets and false teachers are, they're just, they're just empty people. The Bible tells us wells without water. Well, what's that mean? That means you can drop the bucket down into that well, and they may go to great depths. You listening? They may go to great depths to try to, uh, uh, to, try to um, uh, bring about uh, results. But the reality is they send that bucket down and they have to pull it up because the well is dry. The Bible tells us they're wells without water. You, as much as they tr keep dropping the bucket down there and keep spreading their false teachings, they drop it down there and they're, they're, they're just giving you this false sense that they've dropped the bucket. But when they pull the bucket up, there's no living water that comes with it. Hold on, aren't you thankful for Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 when he stood there at the well, at Jacob's well with the Samaritan woman and he said, listen, this water, he even told her at that point, this water, if you drink of that water, you'll thirst again. But he said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. I'm so thankful that when we point people to Jesus Christ, we're pointing them to the living water that whenever we open the Word of God and preach the Word of God, we're giving them water that satisfies. We're not dropping a bucket and telling them that all these things will satisfy only to bring the bucket up Then there's no water. There's nothing that satisfies. And that's what these false teachers, they're exposed by this in their life. They'll go to great depths only to find that there's no lasting results. And not only that, the Bible tells us that when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. And basically tells us that they're more consumed with these external things instead of true transformational change that comes from Scripture. Oh man, we can, we can try to make people look good, and we can try to make ourselves look good, and these false teachers, boy, they can make themselves look nice and have all these nice things about them, but they're more consumed with what they look like than scriptural change. They may be more consumed with whether or not that you look a certain way. So hold on, you ready? So that they can look good around the brethren. Or they may want their, uh, God help us if we're more concerned as a church. Uh, now we ought to do our best for the Lord, but if we're more concerned as a church that we look like whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones, God help us. And that's what exposes, the truth exposes that whenever the truth is lined up against their lives, it proves that they're just deep wells without water. It proves that they're more interested in the external than they are the internal. God is trying to transform us. He's not trying to reform us. God help us to get away from that. God help these false teachers that are spreading their false lies. And if we just look good, and if we just give a good word, hey, listen, then we're okay, and we're accepted. 
the reality is I'm not so much concerned if I'm accepted with this world as much as I'm concerned if I'm accepted with Christ. Boy, believer, we need to see that in these false teachers. If you see them getting along well with the ways of this world, hold on, when you see, when you see that they're praised by people that are wicked, then I'm telling you there's that, there ought to be some warning bell going off in your, in your mind, in your spiritual life, going, hold on, no, no, no. Uh, see, because they didn't like Jesus, they hated Jesus. Jesus said specifically, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Persecution and suffering is a part of a believer's life. And listen, a false teacher, you know, when they're marked by these things, they're marked by more than, than transformational change. They want to be marked by the wantonness, those things that, that make them look good, the vanity, and their swelling words as long as they speak good. Not only that, the Bible tells us that as this truth exposes them, bear with me now, it shows us that they offer liberty, they promise liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Here they are. Here they are, snake oil salesmen selling you liberty. But yet they are bound in the chains of sin. Oh, I, I can't help. I, I told you the other night that you ought to watch that um, Netflix. Uh, listen, uh, here, here I am telling you to watch Netflix. But on Netflix, there's that American Gospel, Christ Alone. You know, it, I didn't need that that documentary um, to, to tell me things. It's stuff we already knew. But God help us, we get like Joel Osteen's up there that just, you know, if you just have a, if you just have your best life now and if you just, if you just have the power of positive thinking and everything. Now listen, I want to be optimistic. I think there is something to be said about being positive. But if that's all that's driving, uh, listen, the reality is there's a lot of defeat and sorrow in life. And yet, Joel Osteen's up there selling snake oil to people. Yet he himself, it's proven out more and more that if he truly knows Christ, he, 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 he's, not, he's not the same Christ of the Bible. It's not the same. He doesn't know Jesus. That's not the same. He himself is in some bondage there. When I think about the liberty, they're offering liberty, I think about I think about something kind of silly to relate this. Um, probably one of the weirdest Disney movies that I used to watch when I was a kid was Pinocchio. I don't know why Pinocchio always seemed weird to me. Kind of freaked me out a little bit too, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> but I never remember one thing about Pinocchio which always scared me was, and, and just uh, honestly, Pinocchio, even the story of Jonah and the whale, you know, with um, Monstro and uh, getting swallowed, him and Jimmy Cricket. If you don't know this, I'm giving spoiler alerts, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, when Pinocchio, he was trying to become a real boy overall, and he went and he followed these other boys that were being brought into this island. It's called the Isle of Fun, or the it's called Pleasure Island. And it was all these games and everything else like that, and all this fun, and they could play, and it's kind of funny that at that time billiards was was the uh, what they show to uh, to be kind of the um, uh, the draw there of oh look how evil it is because billiards was there they played billiards and and everything else like that and and not only that they were smoking cigars they were having beer all types of stuff in this in this story of Pinocchio this Disney story of Pinocchio and so they said boy if you just come to Pleasure Island you'll have all your heart's desire. But you know the whole deal with Pleasure Island was that they were trying to change these little boys. They were slowly changing into donkeys. Kind of funny that way, isn't it? Now if you think, oh, Pastor, what are you talking about, Pinocchio? I'm just telling you that these guys that were bringing these boys to this island, they were offering them the pleasures of life. But yet it was nothing but bondage. And you know, verse 19 is that these same false teachers, they offer all types of stuff. They, they promise liberty and freedom. But they themselves, the Bible says, are servants of corruption. They have no desire for you to live in liberty. Now I think about Psalm 119 that says in, uh, I believe it's verse 14 or 16, maybe I'm messing it up a little bit. Correct me there, but... Um, 
uh, I walk at liberty, before I walk at liberty, because I seek thy precepts. And you know, the only way we truly walk in liberty and we have liberty is when we follow the precepts of God. We walk in his ways. So, truth exposes their way of Balaam, their life is revealed. And then finally here tonight, the sad part is that when truth exposes them, they may know the truth, but they don't love the truth. Look at verses 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his vomit again, his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her uh, wallowing in the mire. Now these, they know the truth. Truth is revealed, but they go another way. Look what it says in verse 20 again. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That means that they may know a lot about the truth, but they're not following and loving the truth. A good example of this that I think about is Ruth and Orba. You remember them from uh, the book of Ruth, and, and of course we know about Naomi and um, her husband and their two sons. They went from the house of bread in Bethlehem down into Moab. And they made that decision, but it was a decision that would change their lives, all of them, dramatically. Uh, the life of uh, Naomi's husband would be gone, and then her two boys who would find wives of their own, Ruth and Orpah, and they would find uh, wives of their own, but soon they would meet their own end and their own death. And there they were, escaping the famine that was taking place in Bethlehem, only to find, only to find death in Moab. And I think about Naomi was headed back up to the house of bread. She heard that the famine was over, and so she decided to go back up. And Ruth and Orpah were there with her. They were daughters, daughters-in-law that were bound uh, to Naomi. And, and Naomi said to them, my daughters, you know, just go, go back to your own ways. It's just kind of a wicked testimony that way. But Naomi was so bitter at that point. Remember, she wanted to be called Mara. And she told her daughters-in-law, go, to go back to your families. Because what am I going to go get married again and have sons? And even if I had sons, uh, you know, they, would you wait for them to be raised up that you can have them as your own husbands? You know, it's kind of interesting. The Bible tells us that Orpah decided to turn back and go her own way, go back to Moab. But Ruth chose for the better. By faith, the Bible tells us that Ruth chose for the better. And she told Naomi, she basically promised her, wherever thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. She said, thy God will be my God. Her declaration of faith right there. You know what that was? Was that not only did Ruth know the truth, but she loved the truth enough to follow it. Sadly, the Bible after that doesn't mention Orpah at all. She's pretty much done after that scene, and Orpah is returned back to Moab, and as far as we know, she knew the truth, but she didn't do anything with it. You know, it's one thing then that the truth of the Word of God is exposed to these false teachers because God's revealed Himself to all men. Amen? That's, that's biblical. But not all follow. Many go their own way, just like the way of Balaam. It's all tied in there. But Orpah and Ruth are a great example. I remember on July 27, 1995, God, and many, uh, many times through His grace and mercy, had revealed to me that I knew about Jesus, but it was time to love Jesus and know, not just know the truth, but follow and love, love and follow the truth. You know, I thank God that day that I made a profession of faith and became a believer and trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I wasn't just a professor of faith, I was a possessor of that faith because now Christ dwells in me. Maybe you have that same testimony. Maybe you don't tonight. I'm telling you, truth is being exposed to you. It's time to not just know the truth, but love it and follow the truth. The Bible tells us here that these false teachers and their followers 
they may know the truth, but they don't follow it. And just like Orpah, they go back to Moab. Not only that, but the Bible tells us then in verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You know, that reminded me of a passage in, in the book of Matthew where Jesus was speaking. In Matthew chapter 10, he was talking about the works that were done uh, in uh, Tyre and Sidon. And he said, Verily I say unto you, he was giving his disciples instruction on how to go about. In fact, I guess I could back it up. In Matthew chapter 10, and he said in verse uh, uh, 13, And if the house be worthy, let your peace come up upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And it's a reminder that, that these that hear the way of righteousness, but if they reject that, even Jesus himself said, it would have been a better, it was a better judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than what is to come to these that reject the truth. These followers, they know the truth, but they don't love the truth. Truth is revealed, but they go another way. Number two, they reject the truth. And Jesus gave that rebuke. And they do reject it. And they go away from it. These false teachers do. And then not only that, but then there he relates the truth to them. Meaning this, that truth is there for them. But instead of like a dog that has good food right there. Okay? A dog that has food for them just right there to go eat. They puke out what they had over here and they go into their own vomit and they eat their own vomit. So here they have a bowl of food over here. Just imagine that, a bowl of food. They go over here and eat their own vomit that they just puked out. He likens it also that their truth, instead of going after truth and following it, they're like a sow that goes back into the, the mire, into the mud, and wallows in it. And that's just a reminder to us that you sit there and go, man, how can these false teachers just continually be about, how can they continue to do what they, pastor, based upon the word of God, how can they continue to do that? Because they don't know the way. They knew the way, but they rejected the way. And just like a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow to the mire, that's exactly what they do. You can, you can get a pig all clean and everything else like that, but the reality is that they go back to the, they go back to the mud and they wallow in the mud. All right. Let's tie this up here tonight with some application. And we'll be done. It's good for us, believer, to identify these false teachers. But let me ask you, if your neighbor, your co-workers, your unsafe family, your unsafe neighbors, your unsafe co-workers, were seeking truth, could they take 2 Peter 2 and see any parts of your life that reveal that makes it look like you live a life of a false teacher? Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What I mean by that is that maybe if we just open up 2 Peter 2 and we can identify false teachers, what if through 2 Peter 2 the Word of God, just like the angel of the Lord standing in the way of the ass and Balaam, is trying to warn us in our lives that we have identifying marks in our life of a false teacher? instead of our identity being wrapped up in Christ. See, a false teacher is all about everything that they are, everything that they own, and all the followers that they have, and their rejection of truth. That, that's what they want to be known by. You know what I want to be known by? Like Paul said, I preach him. I, 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 he basically said this, I may not know a whole lot of things, but I know this, I preach Christ, and Him crucified. That's what I know to do. You know, that's something these false teachers don't want anything to deal with. They don't want to deal with the truth. Believer, maybe we can identify false teachers and look at, you know, the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Osteens and the Mormon and the Muslims and the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Romanism and various others out there. We can look at it and go, wow, you know, that's, that's wicked, that's wicked. But can we check our own life right now and say, man, is my life kind of marked by open sin? Am I just going about? Is my eyes full of adultery? Um, have I just, do I have an authority issue? 
Because the reality is that I want visitors to come to North Hills Baptist Church and I want them to see that we're not teaching false things. We're teaching the truth of the Word of God and letting it speak. And believe it, the reality is that every day you're approached by people in your life and your unsaved neighbors and unsaved co-workers and even your saved co-workers and saved neighbors and saved family members and unsaved family members. They're approaching you and they want to see truth coming out of your life. Maybe today that you you know the truth, but you're not a lover of the truth. These false teachers, they, they're, they're controlled by how they feel and what they just want to do, like an animal does, instead of governing their life by truth. Maybe your life is so wrapped up in the materialistic things. If you just have more, you'll be happy. If my kids just have more, they'll be happy. No. No, there's a lot of people that have a lot of things that pay a lot of money to psychiatrists because they're very, very unhappy. Oh man, even the message that I was going to preach to you tonight was out of Ecclesiastes 7, where Solomon just simply said that it's probably, can I put it this way? It's better to go to a funeral than it is a birthday party. Because you're going to learn a lot more at the funeral about life than you are going to learn at the birthday party about life. You know, many times we just think, man, if I'm just happy. Hey, sometimes it takes mourning. It takes mourning to wake us up to wisdom and what God's trying to teach us and grow us in. Sometimes God's giving us, maybe tonight, God's giving you some warning signs in your life. He's, he's setting up a way. He's setting up a narrow way. He's set up a, a way in which you can't go to the left or to the right. And, and all you can do is just go forward. God's trying to get your attention, but yet you're still rejecting that. And don't be marked by these things. That's what false teachers are marked by. I'm going to take it a step further. Maybe tonight, professing Christian, you think that you profess Christ, that you that you truly know Christ as your Savior. Can you without a shadow of a doubt know that you've trusted Christ, repented of your sin, and trusted Christ as your Savior? And I'd rather know not just know the truth, but I'd rather be a lover and follower of the truth. Is your life marked by just following whatever men may say? Now, I'm thankful for you listening in tonight. I'm thankful for you listening to the sermons. But if you say, well, my pastor said, I think, I think we're messing up here as a church then if that's the case. I hope it's, my pastor said I need to search the scripture and discern from there. We need to be, we need to be Berean Christians. Actively seeing the scripture, whether it's so. Is your life marked by these things, believer? I want to finish off the sermon here tonight with this poem. It's called A Pig is a Pig. It's a uh, it's kind of a funny little poem that lines up with the prodigal son. Come home with me, said the prodigal son. We'll sing and dance and have lots of fun. We'll wine and dine with women and song. You'll forget you're a pig before very long. So the pig slipped out while the mama was asleep, shook off the mud from the mire so deep. Around his neck was a bow so big, he's going to show the world a pig's not a pig. With a snout in, his air, in the air, he trotted along with a prodigal son who was singing a song. It must be great to be a rich man's son. He would surely find out before the day was done. It didn't take long, him long to realize his mistake. He had been scrubbed and rubbed till his muscles ached. He squealed when they put a gold ring in his nose and winced with the pain when they trimmed his toes. He sat at the table on a stool so high, a bib around his neck and a fork to try, while the prodigal son in his lovely robe kept feeding his face so glad to be home. When the meat came around, the pig gave a moan. It looked too much like a kind of his own. He jumped from his chair with a grunt and a groan, darted through the door and headed for home. His four little feet made the dust ride so high, for he didn't stop till he reached that sty. It's what's on the inside that counts, my friend, for a pig is a pig to the very end. Can't help but think about the fact that when it comes down to it, to end off chapter 2, Peter could say to us, they are who we thought they were. It's just as natural for a dog to its own vomit and a sow to the mire. It's natural for them. 
earnestly continue for the faith, identifying these false teachers by their works. Father, I pray that you just bless this sermon and help it to go forth and speak to us, God, that we need to grow and we need to not just identify false teachers, Lord, and false things that are being said uh, about the Word of God and, and things that they may askew from the Word of God. But Lord, also see it in our own life, the hypocrisies that are there. And Lord, that you're trying to get our attention, not to be marked in that, of identity, identity of a false teacher, but identity that's found in Jesus Christ. Help us to be who we are in Jesus. Thank you for this time tonight, in Jesus' name. Good Sunday evening. Welcome back to service tonight. And I didn't change my tie. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, it's fine. Just keep going. No. All right.